to, to continue, continue our fellowship concerning what is life and how we can take this life and what this life will produce. Life needs to be infused into us. It needs to grow. So we need to have life. This life needs to grow. And then the life needs to produce a product. We will begin uh, our fellowship on the matter of something that we shared uh, not too long ago with the uh, collegians at the semester break. We were so touched that we would like to share a little bit more on this matter, uh, just a little bit different uh, since the audience or since it is for the entire country of the Philippines. We will just uh, highlight this matter for my portion of the vine and the branches. And first and foremost, we would like to look at the vine, which is the vine, which is a picture of God's economy. First, we need to look at, we need to look at the book of John. We will navigate through some of the chapters, chapter one, chapter, uh, chapters 10, 14, 17, and 20. We may ask a few questions. What is life? Uh, things like that. What is the spirit uh, for our uh, infusion, for our encouragement, for our going on so that the Lord can have a way to gain what he desires to gain, what he needs to have, which, what will advance us with him and his advancement, what will advance us in him and with him for his advancement, for the terminating of this age to return so that he could really be satisfied. I wanted to get right into what is God's heart again and what uh, he wants to do. He wants to spread him, his expression. This is the production I just mentioned, life, growth, production. This production he wants to spread, or this product he wants to spread throughout the entire world. So this is what is the central point in, well, God's heart. And so if it's the central point in God's heart, it is the central point in the entire universe. This is the central, it's not politics, it's not entertainment, it's not social reform, it is the eternal economy of God. In this economy of God, there's something that is so profound, and we'll see it in John, but one of the matters that is so profound is the Lord in John chapter 3, uh, verses uh, 28 through 30, he likens himself to a, a bridegroom. He desires to have something that matches him as a bride. This is so profound. So what should we be doing? We should care for what is on the Lord's heart. Now, the Lord will say this, where's my bride? Where's my bride? And we will have to answer. If we do not and this is what is touching me in these days, even in these last hours. If we do not cooperate with the Lord for his gaining of such a bride, then not only will we suffer, but even the more the Lord suffers. And it's a small thing for us to suffer. It's a great thing for the Lord to suffer uh, and be frustrated, suffer and not having his satisfaction with a bride that matches him in every way, in, in appearance, in expression, in life, in nature, in function. But that's a huge matter. That's a big thing if he has to suffer the loss of having such a counterpart. It's not so much that we would suffer, but the creator, the begetter, if he suffers, then, then, we are living a senseless, 
contradiction or a sense, a senseless life, a senseless life that is a contradiction. Why are we here? What are we doing? It's, it is as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it is a life of vanity. I don't wanna live a life of vanity. I wanna live a life that will affect the Lord's way to return. I want to live a life that satisfies the Lord. My life is not at that point right now, but I am encouraged to just as I see what I am and see my failures, just to tell the Lord, this is true. The assessment of what I am in myself is just one big failure but I do love you and I do want to go on with you. With that, I would just like to get into how profound some verses, how profound John is. So our fellowship concerning the vine, of course, it's resident there in John chapter 15. But let us look at the, uh, some of the verses in, in the chapters in John that are so profound when we talk about the matters of life, the matters of life. I have some verses here, uh, right here, that I will refer to. But first, the first verse is concerning life. The question that we need to ask, we should ask ourselves, what is life? What is life? And the answer is right there in John chapter one. In the beginning, the very first word, verse, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then look at verse four. In him was life. So life is a person. Life is not something that frees us uh, in, in opposition to death. Death restricts us. and But life frees us. We, we're free to do whatever we want. we want. No, we're not free to do whatever we want. Life is not, quote, 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 freedom. Life is a person. And now in that sense, I say life is not freedom because, I, you know, we use this uh, example of death, death being restricted. Once we, once there is death, you don't, you cannot do anything further. You're restricted. You're, 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 you're dead. And life means that you can go here, you can do what you want and so forth. That, dear saints, is not really what life is. Life is a living person, John 1, 4. And this person is full of light. Uh, and so as, you, as we proceed, as we proceed, we will see what life is and we'll see that life is also the spirit. If you look at um, John 10, if you look at John 10, it says this, and I have it here in front of me. It says this, I have come that they may have life and may have it not more abundantly, but abundantly. This means that the Lord, before the Lord Jesus came as, as the reality of life, and that's our, that is, a life that is something apart from our human life, something that's far, 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 far greater than our human life. This means that prior to his coming, we did not have life. Now that he has come, we can have this life abundantly. This is why John 10.10 10 says what it says. Now the life is available. And so now we have the way to have abundant life. Then I like to look at John 14. In John 14, it says this, and this is verses 16 and 17. It says this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may be with you forever. Even, verse 17, this is verse 17, even the spirit of reality, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him. You know him because he abides with you and shall be in you. This life, this life, where is it? 
He's in you. How do we know this? Well, we have to look at other verses. And John uh, 14, 20 says this, in that day, in what day? In the day of his resurrection. You will know, what? That I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Where is? Where does this life reside? Once we open, and after we open initially, we continue to, to open. So initial, initially, we open. And then as a continual daily practice, we open to the Lord. Then we know that he's in us. And then we know that he is in the Father. My question would be, I would like to ask this question. Do you really know that we are in the Lord and the Lord is in us? As you'll see later as we move through the, uh, the burden of the fellowship and the burden will be that there are so many things that frustrates us from knowing that we are in the Father, that He is in the Father, we are in, we are in Him, and He is in us for our rest, our satisfaction. But even the more, even the more, for His eternal purpose to be carried out, which is which is centered in at least for our today's fellowship, it's centered in John 15 with the vine, which is the eternal economy of God, as you'll see as we move forward. And in, in my next sharing, I'll share a little bit more on the matter of the vine in John 15. Do you really know? That's, that's my question. Do we really know? Well, as we, as we navigate through the word, as we get into the word, as I said, our burden will be the word and frustrations too, coming to and getting into the word and allowing the word to get into us and operate according to what it uh, can do, according to what it, its innate function to do, its innate function to do. And that is to bring us into this life. That is to transform us. That is to impart the divine nature. That is for rest and satisfaction. That is for peace, joy. You will see, and I will repeat these words as we go, because our Christian life should be one of joy, of rest, of satisfaction, not of confusion, not of chaos. And, but, but, well, I shouldn't say but, I should say and, even the more, when we are in him, there's this mutual rest, joy, and satisfaction. But even the more, we can take it even further. Aha. The kingdom will come. The bride will be prepared. The body will be built, built up. The bride will be prepared. The kingdom will come. Then the Lord will have his eternal rest and satisfaction, as you will see. We'll see as we, uh, as we tr uh, travel through all of our fellowship in week, uh, week by week, week by week. Let's now, look at John 15, and this is the burden for this sharing. Uh, and, and again, the frustrations to the vine growing and branching out. And then how we can el eliminate the frustrations. In John 15, it says this, I am the true vine. This is verse one. And my father is the husbandman. And then as you go on, you'll see, and uh, it says, he who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, apart from me. I, this is so familiar. But I wonder if, it's a, if we apply it. Apart from me. Don't be severed from me. You can do nothing. Uh, here in John 15, you have four simple words that we would like to highlight. Number one, the vine. You are the vine. Number two, the husbandman. Number three, the branches. And number four, abide, abide. The book of John is so profound in what, in showing us this matter of what is life. This life is uh, signified or pictured, pictured as the vine. The vine, the vine carries out God's economy. So we're, we're, we're focusing on what is this matter of life and what is the spirit? So as we navigate further, as we continue our navigation through John, the book of John, which is, again, so profound, 
What is life? What is the spirit? I, I have to repeat that. Look at John 17. And verses 21 to 23 says, they say this, that they all may be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me and the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that we may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Hard to follow these verses. What's the difference between being united? We should ask ourselves this question and being one. Uh, the glory, do we have this glory? What is the glory? You know, all these questions we should ask you know, over and over, over and again. Is glory related to this aid, this world? Or is glory related to something in the heavens? Um, Another question, what is to be perfected into one? Look at John 20. It says, receive. When he, said, when he had said this, he breathed into them. This is John chapter 20. And I'm just going to paraphrase verses 19 through 22. Mainly verse 22, two, John 20, 22. Receive the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? If you look at it. Yeah, I, I, I have this verse in front of me. Receive th this part of the verse in front of me. Receive the Holy Spirit. And then in John 6, 63, it says this. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So again, more questions what we should ask as we go through the book of John. What, what's the spirit? What is life? As, so as we go through, we'll see. So let's, let's get into this matter of the vine a little bit, where he says in John 15, he says, I'm the true vine and my father is the husbandman. In the universe, there's only one, there's only one farmer. The reality of farmers today, really there's only one farmer and that is the father. His economy is to have a farm and he wants to produce something. He wants to grow things. Uh, so what does he want to grow? He wants to grow a vine tree. That's it. He doesn't want to grow wheat and grain and all that in, 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 the, in the human sense. He wants to grow one thing. That's the vine tree. And uh, it, this vine tree, the glory of this vine tree is, a, it are, is the branches or are the branches with its blossoms. And so this is God's economy. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the vine tree virtually has no trunk, no trunk. You know, you look at a tree, trunk, but actually the vine tree uh, has, doesn't have a trunk, so, but it has branches. And if you cut off the branches, then almost there's no vine. Very interesting. But the, but the Lord says, I am the vine and you are the branches. <laughs> so the vine includes all the, van, all the, the, the vine, excuse me, includes all the branches. This is God's economy. So that, the, what does this mean? God's economy includes you and I. God's economy includes you and I. I, I know this is so familiar. It's that's such a familiar statement to us. But I wonder if we really considered it. God's economy includes you and I. He needs us. We are the branches. We are the branches. If you look at it, uh, if you look at it, the vine, which is Christ, which typifies Christ, which is Christ. Who, Christ, who is the embodiment of God? So what is God growing himself? God's economy, God's farm, God's farm is to grow God or grow himself. And so he cultivates the vine to develop himself or to produce himself. How does he do? How does he uh, uh, cultivate or how does he develop himself? It's by him branching out of the vine, branching out of the vine. 
the vines, the branches are just the spreading of the vine. Can you do this? Can this be done by our natural life? Absolutely not. The natural life is the branching out of Adam. I mentioned this to the collegians. The branching out of Adam, just as a branch uh, is branching out of a tree, we are the branching out of Adam. <laughs> so that means if we're the branching out of Adam, that means we are the branching out of Satan. Whoa. This is what you see with the unbelievers on the earth today. People are absolutely this kind of branching out. Uh, so every morning, don't look at it yourself. Like me this morning, I looked at myself. I thought, whoa, this is the branching. What I am is the branching out of Satan. <laughs> and this I got from my birth. So I can't do anything about it in that sense of how I received it. But I can do something about it as I realize what am I expressing as a branch? Am I, am I the branching out of Satan or, I'm, or am I a branching out of the vine, which is Christ, which is who is the embodiment of God? So it is the branching out of God, the branching out of God. Uh, uh, <laughs> to be a branch, let me say this, to be a branch of the vine means this that Christ becomes our life. Remember, we were asking the question, what is life? What is the spirit? So now we're starting to see a little bit more of what life is. Life is a vine that has some branches that expresses him. The true life is God. The true life is Christ. And as we are attached to him, that life is expressed through us. And then people can see it. Remember John 17, Father, that, we, that the world may know. Well, how, how can, how is it possible the world may know that God sent the Son, that the Father sent the Son by the branches expressing the life that is in the, in the, in the vine? Distractions. This is a big thing now. I want to say something about distractions and about the word. And our focus, our main burden will be here. Uh, the Lord wants to fill us with, with, with Christ. He doesn't want us to be concerned. Or he is not that interested. He is not that interested in any religion, any kind of work or service that we can do for him. What he is interested in, what he wants is for us to live Christ day by day. Excuse me. Uh, if we do not have such a daily life of living Christ day by day, then when we come together, it's just a theatrical, theatrical performance. We're just performing. We may read, we may say hallelujah, we may say praise the Lord, uh, I enjoyed this, that, or the other. But if we do not live Christ in our daily living, in our daily lives, it's just a theatrical performance. Or the word that the Lord uses in the Gospels is hypocritical. Hypocritical. I know that's kind of, whoa, kind of a buzzword. But a theatrical performance is you are, uh, you're, you're performing something that really is not, is not your reality. That's hypocritical. So, well, you know, when you shout or release your spirit, but you don't have this daily living, then you, you were, we're actors. That's what we are. This is not what the Lord wants. Uh, he wants us to live Christ. And even when we are living Christ, others will know. We, a lot of times, don't even have to say a word. Don't even have to say a word. Now, I, I would say this, and this is not a criticism. This is just a fact that if you look at Christianity, uh, they are not living Christ. So we have to say, uh, excuse me, 
let me say it for let me say it this way. Let me adjust that. For the most part, as far as my experience goes with those in Christianity, from what I have experienced and what I have seen, there's not much living of Christ. I can say that. They're distracted. Uh, they're distracted from the center lane of what God wants. Of, and we can say it this way, of God's eternal economy. You know, it, and we can be distracted, even, even with things such as how we meet. Do we meet in a quiet way? Do we meet in a loud way? Guitars, you know, uh, you know, should we have guitar? Should we not? Should we sing it fast? Should we sing it slow? Of course, there's a lot of profit in how we extract the rich feeling from the hymns. Fast, sing it fast, sing, sing, sing it slow. There's something to that. There's something really to that. But if we are so caught up in, let's sing this fast, let's sing this slow, and we, you know, then we, we could possibly be off. Uh, the only thing that matters is, uh, are, is this life? Is this the spirit? Is this pleasing to the, the spirit? And do we have inward peace, rest, and joy? So don't be concerned about how you, uh, uh, you should meet. Uh, we just should just we should just meet based on the issue of our living Christ. We don't insist on any forms on the way to meet. We just focus on the person and whatever is not of the Lord. Let me say it this way, and actually I'm repeating uh, what Brother Lee has said. He said, "Whatever is not of the Lord, it." causes division. Consider that. Whatever is not of the Lord causes division. Uh, and so what will help us, how to overcome the distractions, how to uh, be one with the Lord and not the cause of chaos and division, is we have to see two aspects of Christ, the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. And we will spend some time on... Uh, the word. Uh, I want to give you an uh, example as has been my practice. It's been so enjoyable for, for and to me of getting into the word and allowing the word to speak to me, allowing the word to wash me, allowing the word to encourage, allowing the word to build, build you up, allowing the word to expose you, allowing the word to expose you through the shining of light that's in the word by one aspect of the spirit. And that is, the, that is thus using the spirit when you come to the word. Um, now, uh, the Lord Jesus himself, as we know, he's the heavenly pneuma, he's the spirit. We all know 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The Lord is the spirit. He's the heavenly pneuma. That's why he said, and we asked the question earlier, what, <clears throat> what is the spirit? Because we use John 20, 22. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That mean, And then he says he breathed. That he is the pneuma, the air. He is the heir, the pneuma, the spirit. And so we have to receive him. He's also the word in the beginning. We quoted, that, we quoted that's why we quoted that verse and read it to you <clears throat> in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. So he's the spirit and he's the word. We, can, we have to take both. We cannot be like the fundament, fundamentalists nor the Pentecostals. One, the Pentecostals, uh, concentrate and emphasize the spirit only. It's good, but not not uh, uh, only. The fundamentalists they uh, emphasize the word. It's good, but you need the spirit. Pentecostals, you need this. You need the word. Fundamentalists, you need the spirit. We need both. So, uh, so even when we come, even when we come to pray, dear fundamentalists use the word and they do 
But you have to use the word with the spirit. Dear Pentecostals, use the spirit. I use the word. Don't, don't think it's something that's abstract and you just come and even um, utter some things that are not discernible to others. No, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. We need to utter words that are understandable in the ears of the hearers. So when we pray, how can we say amen if we don't understand? Well, if you, if you use the word and disregard your feeling and use the word as your prayer, then all of us have the ability we understand and we can say amen. So uh, use the word for your prayer and pray reading should be living and normal. It shouldn't be a form. It should just, it should really just be a way that you communicate with God. And how can we communicate with God? The best way is to give uh, to, to say his word right back or pray, say, pray, speak his word right back to him. The word can do so much. It can change our mood. We, uh, we, can, we can get up in the morning. We're just great. And this happened to me uh, actually this morning. Um, and, uh, but then we go off and then we get into a mood. Um, uh, we, our moods carry us away. Our emotions can, can, can and usually do carry us away. What should we do? Here again, the word. Oh, dear saints, the word of God. I'm, I, I, I don't know what to say. I'm just so helped, encouraged, excited. And, uh, and I'm enjoying so much, the word, especially, and you will see as by way of example, uh, the Old Testament. Uh, so our moods or even our temper, how can the temper be tamed, overcome? Uh, put to the corner. We it will not it will never leave us until the Lord comes back until we're transformed. But it can be shut up in into a room. Let's shut that temper up into a room and leave it there. Uh, and how how can that be done? Our moods can change. Our temper can go fluctuate. You know, lose it. Be upset. But the word never fluctuates. The word never changes. It says what it says, and it will stand forever because it is a person. So we just come to the, so we can just come to the word, come to the Bible and just open it. Now, of course, we're not just open it. Oh, but you know, we have to have, and you'll see in a minute, a religious, uh, not religious, a legal way, legal way of coming to the word. It's always the same. This is not psycholo psychology, and, and, and I'll prove it. Go, go get something written, written by Abraham Lincoln here in the United States, or go get something written by Confucius in Asia and see if it can do, it, it, it can change your mood. See if it can overcome your temper. Only the words of, only the words of the Bible can do that because they are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. Uh, sometimes it might seem that, oh, the spirit might disappear experientially. It doesn't, but ex in our experience, but the word, the word is right here. It never disappears. So learn to contact the word. And so, so I say now, make this a legality. There's some legalities we should keep. And I mentioned to the collegians, there's eating, there's drinking, there's breathing, and there's sleeping. Neglect one of those and you, you will die. The same can be uh, applicable or applied to the word. Come whether you feel into to the word, whether you feel like it or not. This is a spiritual legality. If you want to be healthy, come to the word. If you think you're not getting anything out of it, come to the word. It does not matter. Read. You can read at least you can read one chapter in 10 minutes. Now, I, I know 
you know, we have different languages. And so, you know, if you have the, the word in your mother tongue, at least 10 minutes, you can read it. You can read one chapter. So uh, if, you, if you insist on this legality, if you insist on this legality, you'll be a strong, healthy Christian. So I hope that you would, um, I hope that you would um, come this way. Now, what will happen is as you come to the word, and this has been my experience, number one, you'll forget what you read. So you come to word, you read, and then five hours later, you, what did I read this morning? Or what did I read today? Or by the end of the day, at the very least, I can't remember what I read this morning. And then the evil one will come and say, see, what's the profit in you reading? Because you don't remember. Don't take that that's a lie from the devil because he wants to keep you away from the word. Don't take that. Do not take that. It's like if you put some, something in a strainer, you know, it has holes in it. You, you know, like let's let's just say fruit. Let's just say fruit, or let's just say nothing. Okay, either way, and and you just put water in that strainer. The water runs right out. It just looks like this is fu futile. Futile. This is futile. But actually, every time you put water in that strainer, that strainer itself gets washed. Or, or let's say the fruit. The fruit gets washed. Or let's say the rice. The rice gets washed. The water doesn't, well, the, the rice does retain a little water. But, but the, my point of, of this, my point of this speaking is that it's not so much what you remember, it's every time you come, you are washed. Every time you come, you are sanctified. You'll see in a minute when we get into uh, uh, the read, I want to read a portion in 2 Kings chapter 22. And then the, if you read the Bible, you will uh, sense something's different, but you don't know it. You can't, can't really quantify it or put your finger on it. But something is different. Whether you sense, let me say this, whether you sense something has happened or not, something is happening. Uh, so how can you come to the Bible? Well, come to the Bible, not with trying to understand it. Don't try to understand the Bible, just come. And... Um, and if you read a biography, for example, of someone's experience of coming to the Bible, that's their experience, not yours. So don't try to come to the Bible and get the experience of an autobiography of, uh, 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 not auto, uh, get an experience of someone who has written his autobiography, his or her, his autobiography, and they say, oh, I experienced this. So you come and try to, try to experience the same thing. Just come. Just come. And uh, eventually, as you continue, continually come, uh, life will come and light will shine. And we'll get into light in, in, in another speaking. Uh, so contact the Lord. Okay. So every time after you're reading the Bible um, and you pray the word, and you pray the word back to the Lord. So use the Bible as your prayer book. And every, listen, every prayer, you think the Lord won't answer a prayer that is his word that you are saying back to him? Of course he will. Of course he will. It may not, he may not answer it in two days, two hours, two weeks, two days, two weeks, two months, two years, but he will answer it because you, I, we will we are praying back his word. So the answer to prayer is secondary. The, the primary thing is when you pray, using the word, you're breathing in the Lord. And this is one of the four physical, this is a picture of one of the four physical legalities that we must keep. There's a long-term effect. There's a long-term effect to our reading. Um, and that is, you grow and you don't even realize it. And you're built up and you don't even realize it. It's, it's, it's effortless. And it's spontaneous. And it's almost, it, actually, it is, in a sense, unconscious. You don't realize it's happening. 
but it really is happening. So we have to come together, meet with him, meet in his word when we come together. The issue of our meeting, the content of our meeting is when we have been in his word. And the more we're in his word, the more we become his living testimony. And then it's the reality of John 14, I and you and they and me and the uh, I and you and you and me and the reality of John 17, uh, Father, that they may be one, that the world may know. I and me, you and me, and I and them, and so forth, and they and me. That's the reality. And it comes from something so practical and so um, easy uh, and so much such so uh, available is the word I'm looking for. So available, and that is in and with the word. Now, I would like to close by giving you a example, and I, I, I would like to screen share it so that you can see it. Um, this is um, a portion that really has, um, so let me share my screen, uh, really has helped me um, and very uh, enjoyable to me in, in, in the Old Testament. And this is Second Kings. And this is so, uh, it really uh, affected me in my service. Remember I said, religion is not the focus. Remember I said that our service, our work is not the focus, but that the vine as the economy of God is the focus. That means what? This, the person, the vine is the embodiment of God. How can we extract the person? We need to extract or we need to take in, sorry, we need to take in this person. And as we take in this person, this person is expressed as, as, as the, he's expressed through, I'm sorry, he's expressed through the, vine, the branches. And as he is expressed through the branches, he is glorified. The glory that I had with you, Father, John 17. Now glorify me, Father, with the glory that I had uh, before the world was. Um, uh, let me, uh, this glory, this glory, he's glorified through the branches. And how can, so practically, what's the practical handle? Okay, the practical handle is, uh, is the word. And so I would like to... Um, I would like to go through a little bit of this and then we'll stop uh, and then we'll pick up in our fellowship as we move forward uh, week by week. This is Second Kings. I hope you appreciate this. Uh, again, it's not the matter I mentioned. It's not the matter of religion. It's not the matter of work. It's not the matter of, a ser of service. That's not the focus. The focus is the, fo the person. How can we, again, how can we, take in this person, we have to uh, get take in his word and we have to be legal about it. Okay, This is a portion concerning little King Josiah, as you can see here in uh, verse one. And he was a, he was the king at eight years old. And then when he was 26, uh, he sent, let's look at verse three, uh, this, uh, 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 person who was a scribe, Shaphan, I think that's how you pronounce it. And he said, send him to the house of Jehovah. And he said, and look at verse four, basically he's saying, and I, I'm going to paraphrase and get down to the main portion. But basically he's saying um, to the house of Jehovah, you know, you have to repair it. And so he hired all these people. You look at verse five and six, you see there, he hired all these different ones to work on the house. And then he said, get the money in verse seven for the house, for the, the, uh, the temple. Now understand that the house in the Old Testament or the temple is a, is a dwelling place of God, which, which is, which was in the wilderness, the tabernacle, and in the good land, it was the temple. So, so they go and they work on the house. 
So that is equivalent today in our experience of serving in the church or doing the work. You know, because here it says, for they worked faithfully. So we're in the work of what? Building up the house. That's the work. The work is to build up the house. But look at this. Look at verse 8. He says, the Hilkiah says to, Hilkiah the high priest says to the scribe, Shaphan, I found the book of the law in the house of Jehovah. And then Hil the high priest, Hilkiah, he gives it to the scribe, Shaphan, and he read it. This indicates, boy, he hasn't read it, yet they're serving. And we can say this is equivalent of serving in the church life without the Bible. How do you know what? To, how do you know the service that the Lord needs? They didn't know it. Look here, verse 8. Hilkiah gave the book. It says, Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And then Shaphan goes back to the king, little King Josiah. Well, he's not little. He's, a, he's like 26 at this time. And he says, you know, your servants have, you know, your servants have done all this, this, and this. You see this verse here. I'm not, I'm not going to take time to read it word for word, but you see it there. And, uh, and, and he delivered it into the hand of those who work. You see that? Those who do the work. We're not here. Uh, or I should say it this way. If we are going to work for the Lord and the work is to build up the house of Jehovah, the work is to build up the church as the body of Christ, we must keep ourselves saturated with the book or the Bible or the word, which is a person. Don't forget that. A person. He's embodied in this book. And then uh, look at, look at, look at, look at what the scribe says in verse 10. And he reported to the king saying, Hilkiah has given me a book. The priest, the priest has given me a book. And then he read it aloud to little king, uh, well, to King Josiah. And then my question is, why didn't the king have this kind of experience when he start, He said, hey, the house is in disarray. It needs to be repaired. Uh, why didn't he tear his clothes? Because he did not read the Bible, so he didn't have that much feeling uh, according to the revelation in the book. But once he saw how much the Lord needed the house, and we know this by other, uh, other portions of the scripture, as he, was, as he was hearing the words from the Bible, the, the Bible at that time, it wasn't complete, of course, we didn't have the New Testament, or they didn't have the New Testament. He reacted, he repented, he tore his clothes. And then, uh, and then he says this, Josiah, go inquire of Jehovah for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For the anger of Jehovah, which is kindled against us, is great. Listen, look at this. Because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book by doing according to all that is written concerning us. Dear saints, I would just like to conclude this portion with this. Go to Jehovah, but go with the book. And his, he will enlighten us concerning what we should be doing at this hour. And listen to his words. And then do according to his words, not by our natural strength, but by, uh, let me stop the sharing here, uh, not by our natural strength, but by him, by taking him as grace. And that grace will enable us to carry out what is written in the book. I hope that just this sharing this time will continue to be a encouragement to everyone to number one, open the book to see 
what is on God's heart, to see where we are to, and, to, and to bring us back in line, more in line, I should say, with what the Lord is doing and wants to do in this age. Uh, I hope that this is a little bit of encouragement. We will continue our, fel the fellowship will continue and my portion will continue uh, uh, in a little, in a, in a few weeks. Much grace to you all. Happy to fellowship with you all. I will stop here.